Hey pups, RB here and welcome or welcome back to another fanfiction reading and we're continuing with the Tree of Danger for our recruitment adventure with chapter 4, Mr. Comfrey, Let's Make a Deal. And much like with the last chapter, you won't see any speed drawing footage but a screenshot of two of the characters, Comfrey, the fish guy we briefly saw in the tournament of power arc and the other character, Rozel, I think that's how you pronounce his name? Uh, the bat creature that took on Frieza but ultimately failed and flew away out of fear and completely forgot that if we, that if the ninth universe team lost, they would all die. So that's pretty much it. With all that being said, let's get right into the story. Bergamo was tempted to ask Oregano to elaborate on that last comment, but he figured that he'd get his explanation soon enough. And he was right. After they exited the cave, Orgon and Hysip led the other four warriors to an empty stretch of land a decent distance away from the mountain. He then stood with Hysip in the middle of the field and ordered everyone else to stand back. Once the others backed away, Hysip planted his feet, extended his hands, palms out, and towards an empty patch of grass in front of him. The trio of danger watched in wonder as a continuous stream of ice was expelled from Hysip's hands, forming an ever-glowing translucent tower. The ice tower rose higher and higher, engulfing and petrifying all the nearby flora until it eclipsed the height of even Hysip himself. Once the tower peaked at 11 feet tall, Hysip stopped before walking over to another patch of grass about 20 feet away and repeating the process. After both towers were complete, Oregon had jumped in the air, easily matching the height of the pillars. At the peak of his ascent, he shot dozens of tendrils of white, silky webbing from his fingertips, which wrapped themselves around the tops of the pillars and bound them together. Interesting, thought Bergamo. Ice manipulation and spider webs. I imagine these abilities must work quite well in tandem. But Oregon and Hysip weren't just performing a demonstration of their powers. After Oregon landed, Hysip took a mighty leap towards the towers, catching himself on the webbing that Oregon planted. With the webbing wrapping around his body, he landed on the ground and trudged away from the towers, searching the webbing tighter and tighter. Every subsequent step was slower and more labored than the last, as the web's resistance grew. Just before the web broke, Hysip hopped off the ground and let the web snap back into its original position, slingshotting the giant high into the atmosphere. Creative, no? Oregano asked the other warriors, who were rendered speechless by the bizarre method of transportation they had conceived. And don't worry about losing him. We've done this several times before. I can guess his landing point based on the height of the towers and how far he stretched the webbing. He then used Key to hover over the ground, inviting the others to follow him. And if I'm correct, he landed right in the Jinji River, or close to it at least. Let's go find him. Bergamo, though still a bit baffled by what he saw, decided to follow the eccentric Oregano. If it works, it works, he thought. And so, Bergamo, Lavender, Basil, and Sorrel took off into the sky after Oregano, staying just low enough to scan the ground for any sign of high sip. Mid-flight, Oregano veered close to Bergamo and struck up a conversation with him. Let me tell you a little about Comfrey, said Oregano, even though Bergamo could have sworn he told the old man not to bother with that. Regardless, he just decided to humor the old man, if only because it passed time before they found Hysip and landed. Comfrey's made a name for himself by doing favors. If you come to his swamp and you tell him that you need something done, he'll do it. But the catch, he continued, raising his bony finger, is that he never does a favor for free. You'll have to tell him, up front, what you'll give him in return. And don't try to cheat him, or great misfortune will come to you. Bergamo raised his eyebrows at Oregano. Is he powerful? Very, said Oregano. In his position, he has to be. All his clients would be robbing him blind if he wasn't. As a wise elder, Corridon said, all of us would be thieves if we thought we could get away with it. Bergamo looked away from the old man, rubbing his chin in thought. I suppose I should take Oregano at his word. After all, his logic does make quite a bit of sense. If he wasn't strong, how could he- there, I see him. Bergamo's train of thought was interrupted by Basil, 
who had just spied Heisef's bulky upper body poking out from under the surface of the river. Even though he and the team were a few hundred feet in the air, Heisef was simply too large to miss, especially since his skin tone stood in stark contrast to the mute tint of the river. Gosh, that must be one shallow river, observed Basil. No, Heisef's just treading water, said Oregano. His legs are far stronger than they look, you know. The five warriors all landed at the side of the river, grabbed Hysip by the upper torso, and hoisted him up out of the water. Bergama thought to give Hysip a moment to dry off, until he remembered that they had to go treading through the swamp, and just a moment away. Once Bergama started to survey his surroundings, he noticed a swampland beyond the river extending for several miles, which didn't exactly make him feel confident about finding Comfrey. How exactly are we supposed to find this character? He asked Oregano. We won't have to, said Oregano, giving Bergamo a toothy grin. Comfrey has eyes and ears all over the Priscilla Swamp. You don't find him, he finds you. Bergamo was a bit hesitant to take the word of a hermit, who seldom left his cave, but it wasn't as though he had any other choice. Come on, Basil, Lavender, Sorel, he said, walking away from the river and waddling through the swampland. As the wolves treaded through the swamp, the water level rose higher and higher, until it was lapping at their knees. Bergamo and Lavender were grateful that they had happened to be wearing sturdy boots and heavy leg wear, but Basil and Sorel weren't so lucky. Both of the legs were bare, and thus they had to endure the sickening feeling of the swamp water clinging to their fur. How much longer do we have to walk? griped Basil. Can't we just fly instead? whined Sorel. Bergamo shook his head, eliciting a groan from both of them. We don't want to leave Hysip behind he said, but we won't have to walk for too much longer. Assuming that where Oregon told me is correct, that is. For his sake, I hope it is, said Lavender, giving Oregon a pointed look. Fortunately, it was. The six of them only spent a couple more minutes waddling through the swamp before they were spotted. Where do you think you're going? Called a voice from above. The six warriors' eyes all darted around the Fourier in a nervous attempt to find the source of the noise. Fortunately, said Source was perfectly willing to present himself to them. A myrtle-colored figure dismounted from the top of the tree and swooped downward, weaving through the branches as he descended. As he neared the ground, the figure showed his descent and planted himself feet first right in front of the warriors. He was a gargoyle-like creature with enormous bat wings and a pair of glowing yellow eyes that sat under the third blood-red eye in the center of his forehead. He, like Oregon on Hysip, left his upper body naked wearing only a tan skirt. I asked you fellas a question, snapped the creature. What do you think you're doing? Walking right in Comfrey's turf. Bergamo's face lit up with the sound of Comfrey's name. So this is where Comfrey dwells. Meow, what's it to ya? Well, we're competing in a tournament and we're looking for fighters to join our team, said Basil. If you could just forget about it, interrupted the creature. Comfrey's busy. He ain't seeing nobody today. Beat it. Lavender snarled and stepped out from behind his brothers, bearing his claws. If you don't take us to Comfrey, the only thing we'll be beating is you. The creature's bright eyes widened in fear, and he took a few tentative steps away from Lavender, throwing up his hands. Whoa, whoa, easy, buddy. I don't want any trouble. Bergamo was about to reprimand his younger brother for his aggression, but Oregano beat him to it. He stepped forward and clonked Lavender on the head. Tisk, tisk, Lavender. As a wise elder, Korodos said, anger is a weapon only to one's opponent. Lavender just smuttered some profanities and backed away. This wise elder, Korda, was sounding more and more like someone he wanted to clobber. Listen, I don't know what all this is about, but Comfrey's not available right now, said the creature. I gotta ask you to come back later. Aw, but this is really, really important, cooed Sorrel cocking her hips from side to side as she slid up to the creature. As she wasn't used to treading through the water, she had to raise her knee up high with every step, putting her plump legs on display. Can't we see him for a teensy weensy bit? Really, please? The gargoyle giggled and squirmed around in Sorrel's clutches, believing in that moment that doing what she said would get him to first base. Well, uh, I mean, I guess I could go get him, like, if he's not too, then all of a sudden, the air is perked up to the sound of bubbles popping and swamp water being shifted around. Sorrel let go of the gargoyle and turned to where the noise was coming from. About 20 feet away, she and the others spied a cluster of bubbles on the surface of the water that drew closer and closer, making splashing sounds as it approached. Once the cluster was next to the creature, the bubbles popped and a new figure burst from the water where the bubbles once were, causing a splash that sent droplets flying everywhere. The figure was a green, 
amphibian-esque humanoid with sharp triangular fins on either side of his head, thick maroon lips, and prominent abs and pectoral muscles. Around his waist is a blue skirt, half of which was submerged in the swamp, fastened by a brown belt with a dulled, stained ruby on the buckle. What's all the hubbub? asked the amphibian. His facial fins twitched as he spoke. Did I hear that you palookas are here to see me? Is that Comfrey? asked Basil, turning towards Oregano. You got a baby, said Comfrey, puffing out his chest, laying his hands on his hips. The gargoyle approached Comfrey, with his shoulders slumped forward and his hands ringing. Oh, they won't be here for long, boss, he said. I was just telling them that you're too busy to... Comfrey cut off the gargoyle with a hard smack upside the head. What was that for? cried the gargoyle. For being an idiot! snapped Comfrey. If one Palooka comes treading through my swamp, you can turn him away. If two Palookas come treading th into my swamp, you can turn him away. But six? Comfrey rubbed his chin as he looked at the six warriors up and down. That's something you don't see every day. No, I'd imagine not, said Bergamo. My name is Bergamo, and these are my brothers, Lavender and Basil, and my friends, Sorel, Oregano, and Hysip. He gestured at each warrior as he named them. Charmed, said Comfrey. And this schmo over here is Roselle, he added, pointing to the gargoyle. He's my messenger and my lookout boy. He's basically my eyes and ears. And I do a good job of it too, said Roselle. Don't I, boss? Comfrey just let the interjection pass without a comment. Now, there must be a reason you six are all aching to see me. So out with it. I'll be more than happy to, said Bergamo. We're going to compete in a multiverse tournament, and we're looking for ten warriors to represent our universe. We've heard you're quite the formidable one. Would you do us the honor of joining us? Comfort crossed his arms as both the left corner of his mouth and his left eyebrow arched upward. Yeah, sure. I'll join you a little trouble. Only question is, what's in it for me? Bergamo hissed through his clutched teeth, knowing full well that he should have seen that coming. Bargaining, after all, was Comfrey's specialty. I ain't living in this world for free, you know, said Comfrey. It's tit for tat. You can't just ask me to fight for you and not give me nothing in return. After a moment of hesitation, Bergamo pulled his two brothers and three recruits aside and gathered them into a huddle. Maybe we could give him money, suggested Basil. We're broke, said Lavender, and I don't think we even use the same currency as them. Basil just bowed his head and blushed a bit. Oh, well, what does Comfrey usually use as payment? Bergamo asked Oregano. Heck if I know. Oregano said with a shrug. I've never done business with him. Bergamo's jaw dropped open. You... Then how do you know so much about him? Word travels quickly on this planet, said Hysip. Bergamo kept his glare focused on Oregano, letting Hysip's comment pass without comment. I really wish you'd have told me about this earlier, he said. Before we left, we should have taken some time to come up with a... Oh, oh, I know! cried Sorel. Before the rest of them could even ask what she was thinking of, she left the huddle and skipped up to Comfrey's side. Sorel, wait! cried Bergamo. At least consult us before you. I think I've got something you'd like, she said, ignoring Bergamo. Have you ever heard of a kumi biscuit before? Comfrey shook his head. Nah, can't say that I have. Beaming, Sorel rooted through her pocket and pulled out a small, dish-shaped pastry with orange icing. They're a combined specialty! she said. I usually keep one or two of them on me, in case I get hungry. Try one! Comfrey shrugged, took the biscuit out of Sorrel's hand, and popped it in his mouth. As he chewed, his eyes crept further and further open. A grin expanded across his face. Mercy, this is good! Just the right balance of tangy and sweet, and it melts right in your mouth. What do you put in this? Ah, ah, ah! chanted Sorrel, wagging her paw at him. It's a Kamayan secret, but if you join our team... Oh, and my grandpa whip up a big old basket of them, just for you. How's that sound? Comfrey smirked. You've got yourself a deal, he said, giving Sorel a firm handshake. Bergamo hadn't expected Comfrey to be so easily bribed with food, but he just decided to roll with it. If it works, it works, he thought, which he suspected would go on to be his personal mantra throughout their adventure. I say, Comfrey, do you know any other warriors around these parts? Asked Basil. I do exclaimed Roselle. Her name's Hop, from Mint City, semi-finalist at the Bacara Martial Arts Tournament. And oh boy, she's a nasty one. Nastier than you would ever believe. Nobody ever wants to cross paths with her. Lavender's eyes lit up. Ah, sounds like she'll do nicely, he said, donning a sly grin and licking his chops. Just take us to the city then, and we'll go find her. Roselle backed away from Lavender, wringing his hands. Oh, I don't know about that. It's not gonna be easy to reach her. Not easy at all. Lavender lost his smile. And why's that? 
he demanded, narrowing his eyes at the gargoyle. Roselle gulped. Cause she's in prison. Alrighty, that concludes another chapter of the Trio of Danger fame fiction. Again, sorry for the lack of speed drawing footage there is, but hopefully there will be one in the next chapter when we get to Hop's chapter. And once again, we are ending on a cliffhanger right here. So stay tuned for chapter five. If you like this video, let me know in the comments if you want to see more videos like this. And be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to see more videos like this and whatnot. And also link to the original fanfiction is in the description below. Be sure to give the original author some love and support for their work and their fanfictions. And with all that being said and done, I'll see you in the next one, pups. Cue the outro. RP is out. Peace! What was that for? Cried the gargoyle. For being an idiot! Snapped Comfrey. <laughs> for some reason, my mind went to Tony Pajamas from The Amanda Show. Do you guys remember that? Do you guys remember that show? The Tony Pajama skit with Drake Bell, Josh Peck, and Amanda Bynes as Candy. <laughs> oh boy.